Okay, good morning everybody. We're we're ready to go. All right. Um a lesson today, if you've got a book. We're on page um I believe it starts on page uh, 29 there. Purpose of humanity. And the passages is uh, our uh, Genesis. So this is the hard to find book, Genesis. And it's the hard to find chapter, chapter one. All right. So we're looking at this one. This is um, this lesson is titled "The Purpose of Humanity," which is something that a lot of people struggle with purpose in their lives. Um, and uh, but uh, the that question is answered in the subtitle of the lesson: "God created us to serve and honor Him." That is the purpose. But um, it does get, uh, we do complicate that sometimes. And, you know, we have uh, these questions that we get into, like, what am I supposed to be doing with my life? Why am I here? What's my purpose? All of that stuff. And people really get into struggles with that. But the answer is in the Bible, and you don't have to read very far in at all. Uh, Just to find that answer. And we're talking about the first man and the first woman. And we could see in the scriptures what they were created to do. And now we are all descended down from them. What they were created to do is the same thing that we're created to do. So that will tell us if we look through these passages here in just a few minutes here. We'll look at these and that will tell us what our purpose is. And the purposes and the duties that God has created us for and the things he has created for us and they haven't changed since creation so let's pray and we'll we'll look into these scriptures here heavenly father we thank you so much for bringing us all together again to worship you to study your word and to better understand what you would have us know today we thank you for all those who are here with us today we Pray that you will lift up and encourage those who couldn't be here with us today also. We pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit be with us today and be our teacher. And let us uh, understand, Father, the great glory of your creation and and the purpose you have for each and every one of us. As a a church, together, and each one individually. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay, so let's look at the first section here. We're in Genesis chapter 1. It's verses 1 through 5. And we, um, we know these pretty well by now, I would say. But there's, um, there's a lot to this very first part. In the beginning, there's a lot that happens uh, that um, will tell us a lot about what our purpose is. And it starts with what uh, God reveals about himself in the creation. So we'll look at these verses. Genesis 1, chapter, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 through 5. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. So we have a, a, an account of the beginning, the creation. And we have God and all three persons present here and accounted for. We have the Father. We have the Spirit that moved upon the waters. And we have the Word, which is Jesus. We have the statement that God said. 
which means the word. And that is in John 1, 1 through 3 that we have further evidence of that. It says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So we have light being made here. So the word has to be there. So we have their trinity there at the creation. Now this, this story, as our book will tell us, is a little bit different from all the other stories that were going on, especially in the ancient world. In the ancient world, these mythological gods that people were worshiping, um, other than the Israelites, was, were, uh, they were all uh, multiple gods, divided gods. And when they came up with creation myths, they had to, uh, their gods uh, in these creation myths would uh, create the world, create the universe in these myths out of something that was already there, like some cosmic egg, some uh, corpse of another god, or some pre-existing matter. The, the idea that uh, a deity, a single god, would create, create, take creation out of completely nothing, that kind of power, these false gods, they, it seems like they couldn't even be pretenders to that kind of power. <laughs> we know that there's only one god who can do that. Because there is only one God. So these, if we look at um, page 30 on, in the book there, we get a little bit of an account from the book about this. Look at paragraph, the last paragraph there. It says, The Israelites were surrounded by groups of people and settled in established civilizations, Egyptians, Canaanites, and Hittites. If these groups were perceived as more civilized, the Israelites would be tempted to think the stories of their gods were more established too. Maybe the Egyptians were right, the world was birthed out of a cosmic egg, or perhaps they should consider the Mesopotamian belief that all we know was created out of the carcass of one of the deceased gods. Genesis 1 reveals a wholly different account, one that quickly cuts to the chase. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, it's almost as if the writer were saying under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, listen, I know you're hearing all kinds of confusing things from all kinds of people. Let me tell you about who is really in charge, what he did, and how you can know him. So the people had gone into all manner of um, false gods and beliefs and things like that, but uh, in this creation it's laid out for uh, all of us to understand this is really how it happens. And it's important, I think, to the study here, if we look at what went on here, when God created the heaven and the earth, uh, what he does is he brings it forth not out of something that's already there, he completely creates out of his own will. But if you look at the way that God creates it, it shows a lot of his character, and it shows a lot of the character that we saw manifested in Jesus Christ as well. If you look at verse 3 there, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. There's an invitation. He says, let there be. Now, we know God, the light didn't come from anywhere else. It wasn't there before. So why would God say, let there be light, instead of, light, now? Because it is the character of God to be invitational. We know that from our experience. I sure do. It's, God invites us to have a relationship with him. His son, he invited us to believe and have salvation. And his spirit is continually inviting people to recognize sin, to repent from sin, to go to prayer. We end the services with invitation hymns because it is the spirit of God that is inviting people to come to God. Our God is a God of invitation, and we'll see why the inviting nature of God is important to our purpose in life here. If you look in verse 1, it's, it's a definitely a blessing that this God 
who created the heaven and the earth. It says in verse 1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Now think about that. There's that one verse, and so much is happening there. But it's just one little verse in the Bible. Now it goes on to define a little bit more of what God does to the earth, but the actual creation of heaven and earth is that one verse in the, in the beginning. Now, to God, it's just that simple. God could call forth the heaven and the earth just like that. It's no problem for him. But just think about all that involves. You know, the earth, they said, was uh, without form and full of darkness, but the earth's pretty big. And the heavens, uh, you know, planets, stars, <laughs> everything that's out there, he called all that in there, too, all in that one verse. And I can tell you, uh, if, if, if someone like, say, if I had created the universe, you'd still be hearing about it to this day. <laughs> to God, it just has one little verse in there, All right? People would be saying, you know, can I get off the earth so Jason will shut up talking about how he created the earth? <laughs> so we have a blessing that the God who created the heaven and the earth, he didn't stand away from it. He is still concerned with all the people that he created in the earth. He wants a personal relationship with everybody in the earth. If you look at page 31 on the last paragraph, if you look up at the night sky, you will see a carpet of stars, most of which would make our sun look tiny. If you look down below your feet with a microscope, you will see an entire ecosystem of bacteria that work together to make sure plants can grow. God did all that simply by his word, and the creator of all of that has invited us into a relationship with him, to know him deeply and to remain in him forever. So that God does, require, does ask for a relationship with us, and he has certain requirements for that relationship. But with all he gave us, the rewards that we reap if we have a relationship with God, uh, they're more than we can imagine. So we look at the next verses here, and we'll, this will tell us what mankind is when he's created. That's going to tell us what our purpose is. You get Genesis 1, 26 and 27. And God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. So we see when God created mankind here, he did so uh, as described here, in our image, after our likeness. Speaking as the Trinity. And we can be sure then that this does not mean that we are physically look like God. Right? We know that God is not, uh, we're not in the image of God in that we have two arms and two legs and a head and a face, things like that. Because if we, have, if we read John 4.24, it tells us God is a spirit. And if it were just that we physically appear as God, or even that we appear as God uh, at all physically, uh, you give a lot of um, points to evolutionists in that case, because apes have two arms and two legs and head and face. It's a lot more than that to be in the image of God. And we know animals are not in the image of God. If you look at verse 26, or a, rather it's verse 25, you have to go back one there. It does tell us, And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth on the earth after his kind. So animals we, we read here are made after their kind. Man is made after the image of God. So we have a different method of creation, a different way that God created us than the animals. Animals are created, it says, after their kind. So, and if it kind of makes sense that way. It almost sounds as if animals are kind of rubber stamped. Animals are all sort of the same, aren't they? They're, they have certain instincts, but they they don't generally have uh, very different personalities. Um, 
and they generally behave the same way. We have um, a spot down here up the road, and I warn everybody, be careful up here. Just up beyond the falls on Cummins Mill Road, you've got a big field where a lot of deer are, and they like to hang out by the road. And one thing that you can be sure of, if that there are deer hanging out by the road, and they see a car coming, they're gonna run out into the road, probably. And we know that when deer see a car coming, when the headlight's on, they'll freeze up. Because we even have a saying that if you are paralyzed by a decision, you are a deer in the headlights. Because deer tend to do the same thing. Animals generally all the same. But humans aren't like that because we're not made after each other's likeness. We're made in the image of God. So how are we in his image then, if not physically? Well, we are, as the, our book talks about icons, representations of God. Look at page um, 32 there again. This is the first and second paragraph. It says, perhaps you're familiar with the idea of religious icons. They are small representative figures that people look at to remind them to think about someone or something else. For example, some Christians look at the image of the cross... And that image causes them to contemplate Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Unfortunately, some people tend to worship an icon rather than the one it represents. Many of us use icons every day, and we don't even know it. They are tied to the apps on our smartphones. Tap on a picture on the home screen, and an application launches. The word for that picture is an icon, an image that points you somewhere else. That's what we are, then, for God. We are in his image. We are an icon. We are representative. We are to point to God. And we have, uh, the, the book talks about religious icons. Religious icons will remind you of uh, certain things that have happened, certain blessings that we have received from God. And religious icons are crosses. We've got crosses in here. I've got a big one back here. And you know, we don't worship that cross we worship what it represents. We worship the one who died on the cross. And to look at the cross re reminds us, it represents to that to us. And so we are to represent God. When people look at you, they should see a Christ-like life, and they should say, I'm reminded of what God is, what Christ was. So that, in that way, we are in his image, and that we are representations of him. But we are also spirits. Remember, God is a spirit. We see in Genesis 2, 7, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So God has given to us a living spirit, a living soul. And we receive from God something that the animals didn't. God didn't do this to the animals when he created them. And then we aren't self fulfilled as God is, so we have to have bodies to clothe our spirits and our souls. So we have flesh clothing, and even if our old bodies are cast off, we get new bodies. The Bible tells us that. So when they speak of man in the Bible, they're talking about mankind. And the Bible even says God created man in verse 27 in his own image. In the image of God created he him Male and female created he them. So man, being the race of mankind, was created male and female. And a human being the spirit, the clothes being the body, God has no preference then, no greater value for a man over a woman, a woman over a man, one race over another, or anything like that. So we should reflect God in that as well. And just remember before, this is before sin came into the world that all this happened and we can see that the body is not corrupted by sin or anything here so that's why the, the, we read that the man and the woman were naked and were not ashamed so another way that we're in his likeness is that we are valued, God has put a lot of value on us, he's went through a lot of trouble for us and he even has directed us to put just as much value on each other and in that way, we will reflect God. In Genesis 9, 6, he says, Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man's blood shall 
blood shall his blood be sh shed for in the image of God made he man so this is after the fall of man after he was ejected from Eden and sin has entered the world and maybe put graffiti on this image of God God still considers it his image and considers it worth valuing we're like God in that we're self-determined we have our own will now, of course, God has his own will. He can do whatever he wishes. He can make any choice that he chooses. Now, we have that freedom, too, given to us by God. And God gave us that for a reason. But in order to make choices, we have to have more than one choice to make. If God gave us only one choice to love him only, it's not a choice. And it, if we love God only because there's no other choice, it's not much value to God. So God gave us the choice. He gave us more than one choice. We can choose to love him and reflect the love that he gave for us back at him. Or we can choose not to love him or even to hate him. So there is the option. And when we choose the option to love him, that gives meaning to it. That we had the choice and we chose to love him. To God, that, that gives meaning to it. And if we choose not to love him, we have failed at one of our great purposes in life. Because we are to love God. That's one thing that we were created for, to love God. So let's look at uh, 28 through 31, and let's just see. What, what does the Bible say? That's, that's, that's what we are. What is our purpose? So Genesis 1, 28 through 31. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth. And subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb-bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree, in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for meat. And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to every thing that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So let's see what our purpose is. Well, God tells us in verse 28, he told the man and the woman, be fruitful. Now, be fruitful has a couple of meanings. Be fruitful in the Bible often means just to reproduce. And he does say multiply. And he said to be fruitful to the animals as well. So we are to multiply, to reproduce, and to fill the earth up. And why is that? Because we are to reflect God as be be well as we can. God has told us in that verse, subdue the earth, have dominion over it. Well, how can we have dominion over it if there are just two of us living you know, on one continent? somewhere on the earth. We've got to fill it up. And we're going to reflect, in a very small way, God's uh, superior attribute of omnipresence. We're going to be spread all over the earth so that we can cover it, so that we can have that dominion over it. And we'll reflect him in that way because God has dominion over all things. And he asked us to have dominion over this one small thing, the earth. So, it also means be fruitful, as we've seen in a lot of other verses. I think a couple of weeks ago we talked about the, the grapevine and the true vine and how a branch off the vine will have fruit. And Jesus used a lot of metaphors and parables about being fruitful. Fruitful, in those cases, he was talking about spiritual fruit, bearing fruit for God. Uh, and that was in John 15. We were looking at that, yeah, last uh, couple of weeks ago. Yeah, so we are to produce spiritual fruit. That's be fruitful, God said. And that means going to work. Doing work for God. And we tend to think uh, work is a kind of a bad thing, something we don't want to do. We don't uh, want to work all the time. But work is not a bad thing. Work is a good thing. Work is not unpleasant or punishing. And to work for God is a blessing. And we know that because when he put the man in the garden... This is before there was sin. He gave him a directive 
to work in the garden. <laughs> so he wasn't punishing the man by telling him to work in the garden. He was only giving blessings to the man at that point. And when he told him to work, that was a blessing to the man. So the thing that we get mixed up is with, between work and labor. Well, labor is something that will bust your back and something that will cause you to sweat and something that will uh, cause you to get tired and things like that. Uh, and when we filled the world with sin, we caused work and labor to sort of get fused together. So as long as we're on the earth, work and labor, they're going to go together. But that, God didn't say, well, since this has happened, you no longer have to work. God said in Genesis 3.19, In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, until, until dust shalt thou return. We are still to work in the world for earthly fruits, but we are also still to work for spiritual fruits. And because we are in the world still, it's going to be laborious to do both of those types of work. But God still commanded us to be fruitful. Because God is fruitful. God provides things for us. And we give back to God by providing things for each other, providing uh, spiritual fruit for him. So it's a good thing to work for God. And there's going to be work for those who are saved all your life. And when you pass uh, away and you pass out of this world, there's still work for you to do. If you look in Revelation 22, 3, it says, And there shall be, this is in heaven, There shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. You will do work for God in heaven. Now it does say in fourteen thirteen of Revelation, And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. We rest from our labor, all the backbreaking suffering that is sin has brought to the work that we do. But we still have work to do, because work is a blessing. To work for the Lord is a blessing. But the labor has gone away from it. So when we get to heaven, we will have a job to do. And that probably is relief to some people who, you know, uh, might get hung up on, you know, descriptions of heaven, which is uh, a problem in the first place. We shouldn't apply an earthly uh, description of heaven to heaven because heaven's not just another earth. It's not going to be anything like the earth. So uh, when you think about, you know, am I going to just be hanging around in heaven and doing nothing all day? No, nope, there's going to be plenty to do. It's going to be work to do. Uh, so that's what God says. He says, be fruitful. Do the work here on earth and produce spiritual fruit for him. That's one of the purposes we have. God also says to subdue the earth, reign over it, over every living thing. We have authority. That includes animals, plants, the ground, the earth, everything. And the resources of the earth. So those are ours given to us by God. They, that we have the animals and the plants. They're for food, but also to use however we want. But again, that authority comes from God, and when we exercise that authority over the earth, we are re reflecting God. We are beginning an image of God, reflection of God. And that is one of our purposes, is to subdue the earth, to control the earth, to uh, bring it under control. But also, it is a responsibility, that's stewardship that's often talked about. Um, and if you read the, the second paragraph on 33, it talks about that. As his image bears, we were created to rule over the animals and over the earth. The Hebrew word rada is translated have dominion and means to subjugate, to have dominion, or to reign. Humans made in God Im God's image are capable of thinking, discerning, and making choices as God's ruling representatives of governing the earth in his place. In caring for God's creation, including his creatures, we should seek to use, not abuse, or misuse what God has provided us. So that's one of our purposes. Take care of the earth. Use it, but take care of it. Another purpose that God tells us about is to be righteous. Now in the beginning, these, this man and this woman, they had righteousness of their own. They were without sin. 
Because ver verse 31 tells us God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. That included the man and the woman that, that, he, that he had created. It was good, everything that he made. This was just, I think, the man at this point. But everything that he had made, it was very good. There was no sin in the man. The man was righteous. But when the man and the woman, they disobeyed God, they lost their righteousness. And we can't regain the righteousness on our own. In Isaiah 64, 6, it says, But we are all of an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. So we cannot regain. We cannot go to God and say, I've, I've made restitution on my own for my righteousness, for my sins. Can't do it. So God provided for us a way that we can have righteousness, but not our own. When Jesus Christ took our sins, there was a trade-off. He took our sins, gave us his righteousness before God. So if we accept that and accept him, we have a righteousness. So we seek that righteousness. And when we gain that righteousness from Jesus Christ, then we have the responsibility to seek righteousness in our lives, live as a righteous person as well as we can. So that's our responsibility. And all of these responsibilities that, we t that we're talking about here, they really just go back to one big responsibility that that God has given us one big purpose that we really are just trying for. And a lot of times, whether we know it or not, there's just one real thing that we're trying for here on earth. It's to serve God and to be restored to him. We want to rewind back to Eden, to the way that we were in the beginning, and what we lost to be regained again. Now, we can't rewind it back. And there's a saying, the only way forward is through. Have you ever heard that? We've got to go through it. And if we believe then on Jesus Christ, we confess sins, we seek redemption through his blood, we work to do the will of the Lord, while in the earthly bodies we bear that spiritual fruit for him, then there will come a day when he will release us from the fleshly body We'll do work for him, and there won't be any sweaty brows involved. And we will be restored to that state where we walk with him, we talk to him, just like they did in the garden. You'll remember, in the garden, when the woman was created, it tells us that God brought her to Adam. God was there and just brought her to him. And we know from, from the creation stories here that God walked in the garden in the cool of the day. He was walking around in the garden. And it was only when sin entered the world that there was any kind of separation that had to be healed between us and God. If you look in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, it says, For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. For now I know in part, but then I shall know even as also I am known. So Paul writes that, When we're completely restored to God, we see him face to face. You will be able to learn from Jesus Christ face to face and sit at his feet and be taught. Revelation 22, 3 says, He in the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. This is the new restored city. It sounds a lot like the garden, doesn't it? There's a tree of life there. There's no sin there. And Revelation 21.3 says, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And this, again, is the relationship 
all the way back to the start before sin entered it when God will walk around with us again. And it says, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people and he shall, it says again, himself be with them and be their Lord. So God will be with us, dwell with us, and we know from the Old Testament stories when they had the tabernacle and the temple, because they had so corrupted themselves, because we have so corrupted ourselves, because I have so, had so corrupted myself with sin that there was a division. And only in the tabernacle in those days where they could encounter God, it was, had to be a certain special place in the inner temple there where you could go and, and have access to God in that way and it took the sacrifice of Jesus Christ the the son of God as a mediator to open that up so that we could have access to God through him but when we are fully restored we will have access complete access walking and talking with him completely with him like we were at the very beginning and that's, there will be no need, we're told in Revelation, no need for the temple or the tabernacle or anything like that. It says, uh, God is the tabernacle. God is the temple now. So that is all uh, what we're, our purpose is. We are seeking to be restored to that. And we are restored to that. There's a path been opened because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We're able to do that. And God created that way for us and through great sacrifice and suffering of the son we have that that option and that's why it is uh, such a blessing that our God is a God of invitation he is the God of invitation and he invites us to return to him this way he has provided a path to run to go back to him we got to go through but the path goes back right to where we started, where we are blessed of God and the blessings even then will be more blessed than Adam was when we return. Revelation 22, 7 says, And the spirit and the bride say, Come. Let him that heareth say, Come. Let him that is thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. So there's the invitation and the nature of God. The spirit, the bride, says, let him that heareth come. They all say, come. And those who are here today uh, that, that are not saved, uh, God is saying, come. The Son is saying, come. The Spirit is saying, come. And take from the water of life freely and be restored the way that the man and the woman were in the beginning before sin entered the world, God has created a way. He's going to cleanse the sin of the world. Now, we can be cleansed of that sin through the blood of Christ, but if that sin remains, we will be cleansed with the sin, and that's a terrible thing. So let's, let's pray, and we'll end there. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for bringing us together. We thank you again for your beautiful creation that you have shared with us so, so bountifully. We thank you, Father, for all your mercies in creation. We thank you for providing for us a way to be redeemed to you after the, uh, the disobedience, the sin that was, that was injected into your beautiful creation. We thank you, Father, for bringing us all together again. We thank you for the fellowship and the blessings that we have already received today. We pray that you'll be with us in the service. Be with Brother Bill as he brings the message. Be with our song leaders as we exalt you in, your, in song as you, as you so richly deserve. And, for all, any, uh, anything that is needed here at the church, among its members and, and outside the church, Father, please bring it to our attention that we might address it. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Quick announcement. The building.